Hey, just how big can a genome get? What's the largest possible size of a genome for an individual organism or an individual cell? The genome being all of the hereditary material in a particular cell, or all the nucleic acids, the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's. Just, just how big can a genome get? Now there's an opposite question. Just how small can a genome be and still form a viable organism, right? A viable cell. This is sort of, this would be like asking, what's the, the, the max size of a genome and still have it possible for an organism to survive with such a large genome? Or another way to put it is just how much genetic information can an organism maintain, right? And be able to pass on from one generation to another. But then that gets us into an additional question. If you have an enormous sized genome, and we're going to look at some of the largest, that's what we're here for. I'm going to show you four recent papers. We're going to look at a paper about diatoms. We're going to talk about uh, lungfish. We're going to talk about a fern. Uh, and then we'll actually just on the side take a look at some uh, crazy deer uh, genomes. All right, so four papers, very recent papers. I'm going to read the abstracts. And we're going to learn a little something about the largest genomes. But a question we should have back in the back of our mind as we're doing this is just how much of this genome is functional? These enormous genomes. Is, does the organism need to have a genome this size in order to do what it does? And if it doesn't, what exactly is all that other stuff doing in the genome? All right, so let's get to it. Let's, let's find out what some of the largest known genomes of organisms are and a little bit about what um, forces are thought to have brought these genomes to their present conditions, all right? What evolutionary forces have caused these genomes to expand or allowed these genomes to expand to the point where they are? Let's dig into the first one, which is the genomes of all lungfish inform on genome expansion and tetrapod evolution. Uh, this paper by Manfred Schartle and a whole bunch of colleagues, uh, most of, many of them at uh, uh, various uh, German uh, institutions, have uh, set about to sequence the entire genome of all the different living lungfish. And there's a reason why the lungfish genome hasn't been sequenced to, until now. And that is, it is enormous. Uh, the largest, as they report here, is uh, 91 billion base pairs in size. For context, you and I have, uh, in one copy of our genome, have only about 3.3 billion base pairs. So almost 30 times the size of a human being's genome is a lungfish's genome. Okay, let me attempt to read this abstract and decode it for you a little bit. The genomes of living lungfishes can inform on the molecular developmental basis of the Devonian sarcoptogenian fish tetrapod transition. So again, the lungfish lie in this sort of region between uh, the fish that you typically think of, then you got your lobe fin fish, and then you have your amphibians. And it's right in that particular zone, in that particular time frame, where it's thought that the fish to tetrapod transition took place. So again, a lot of interest in this particular genome. We de novo sequence the genomes of the African and South American lungfishes. There's two different species. They're in two different genera, two different genera, which gives you some indication there's thought to be big differences between different lungfish. And de novo sequenced means they just start from scratch, right? They're not starting with another genome. They're just like, we're going to, we're going to sequence all the DNA in this thing and construct the, the, the chromosomes and figure out the entire genome without using other genomes as references to kind of help us piece it together. Now, the second genome, the one from South America, the Lepidosiren genome, is about 91 gigabytes or roughly 30 times the human genome. It's the largest animal genome sequence so far and more than twice the size of the Australian. There's, a, there's another genus of lungfish and the African lungfishes. Owing to, now here's their, their explanation for why it's so much larger, to an enlarged intergenic regions, to enlarged intergenic regions and introns with high repeat content, about 90%. All right, intergenic regions would be the spaces between genes, 
And then you have introns as well. So introns are the spaces within genes, right? The intervening sequences that have to be spliced out before you put the pieces of coding sequence together, right? So they aren't truly part of the final code that makes the, uh, the protein uh, and therefore are removed. And all of this has really high repeat content, meaning they're repetitive sequences. Some piece of sequence that's been copied over and over and over and over and over and over again, uh, millions and millions and millions and millions of times, such that it constitutes about 90% of the genome of this particular lungfish, uh, or really all these lungfish um, have highly repetitive sequences. You and I have lots of repetitive sequence too, like some 60% of our genomes. Well, depends on how you define repeats. There's different kinds of repeats, but, um, we have a, let's say a majority of our genome is repetitive sequence as well. All lungfish genomes continue to expand as some transposable elements are still active today. So they're saying there's huge variances among the lungfish genomes of these different genera and species of lungfish. You know, the differences are 30 to 40 billion base pairs. In other words, multiple times the human genome differences between these different uh, um, lungfish. And so why is that? One of their, they think that it's possible that it's the genomes are actually getting larger over time. They're not shrinking. I mean, all genomes, I mean, you could look at any genome from any organism. You can actually ask the question, is this genome actually expanding in the species? Is the genome getting progressively larger over time because it's adding repetitive elements and transposable elements and duplicating genes and so forth? Or is it contracting? Is it losing pieces, right? Are, are, are chunks being lost through mutations? right? And not replaced. And therefore the genome is shrinking or is it remaining relatively stable, um, through time? And there's sort of some kind of balance between the number of mutations that are removing pieces of DNA, uh, and things that are happening to copy extra portions of DNA or insert pieces of DNA, like transposable elements, increasing the size of the genome over time. Well, in this case, it appears that lungfish have continued to increase the size of their genome. And they think it's due to transposable elements that are still active, right? Transposable elements are portions of DNA that have the capacity to splice themselves out of the DNA or really copy themselves out of the genome in one place and then insert themselves into another position in the same genome, right? Inside the same cell. So they have the original sequence and then they've made a copy of that sequence and placed it somewhere else. So if you have a thousand base pair uh, transposable element or 1500 base pair transposable element and you move it somewhere else, well now the genome is that much larger. When the cell goes to copy itself, it's gonna copy both of those positions and you have a larger genome. So if you have many, many, many active transposable elements, right? Ones that are still have the ability to splice themselves or cut themselves or copy themselves out of the genome, then the genome can progressively continue to get larger. You can think of these as like kind of like selfish elements within the genome that are, that are using the genome to copy itself. Um, so they have identified that there are a number of transposable elements that are still living inside of the uh, lungfish genome. But you and I have many transposable elements in us as well, but um, I mean, on the order of thousands of different ones, and yet very, very few of them are known to have been active in anybody that's alive today. And therefore we consider them dead transposable elements. They have mutations in them such that they are incapable of sort of resurrecting themselves and, and making themselves um, perform the action of copying themselves. So we just copy the piece of sequence that used to be a transposable element, and we simply copy it one for one, all right? So they're not increasing our genome size as a result. But in the case of these lungfish, they've identified that they have active transposable elements. They can see the sequence, they can see it's viable still, it has the right codes in order to be able to function as a transposable element. And so uh, they suggest that this particular uh, genus that has the 91 billion base pair genome, the largest known, at least to this point, uh, genome among animals, uh, has an act has active transposable elements, and it's been growing as fast as you know maybe um, what do you say 
adding the equivalent of one human genome every 10 million years. Right? So adding 3 billion base pairs every 10 million years. That might sound like a lot of time, and that's a lot of cell divisions, but even having active transposable elements doesn't mean they're happening like every day in every cell. Right? There's still rare events that these copying events occur, these duplication events occur. Uh, and so they're going to take a while to expand and accumulate. This massive genome expansion seems to be related to, now why do they have active transposable elements? Because here's the thing, if, if transposable elements were active on the, on, the, on the scale of every generation, they were jumping around and making copies. Well, when they copy themselves and insert themselves into other positions of the genome, those are a form of mutation. You know, it's it's adding new DNA, but it's also splicing itself into another portion of the genome, and that could disrupt the genome, right? You could it could splice itself into another gene, in which case it disrupts that gene. If that gene is important for the survival of the organism, that would be a bad mutation, a bad transposable element um, action. And or it could just splice or it could splice itself into a position that changes the like the how you use the gene, how you control the gene, right? Many different ways to disrupt the genome. So if you had too many disruptions, you'd eventually degrade the organism's ability to survive, and therefore the transposable elements would eventually kill its host. But if the transposable element is only causing a new transfer, right, a new copy of itself every few generations or every couple hundred generations, right? Then you have fewer, fewer chances that it's going to end, end disrupt that organism because it's just one at a time, right? And the organism has a chance to adapt to that new piece of sequence that's found in it. Even if it had a slightly detrimental effect, but the organism still survives, they then have a chance to go through multiple generations, potentially having mutations that adapt to that particular transposable element being there, and have changed how they regulate that particular gene in order to get it back to some sort of state of being, uh, you know, more efficient than it was um, than it was when it had that transposable element inserted into it. All right, so that's that's why the transposable elements are are that's the selective pressure on transposable elements not to copy themselves too frequently. Otherwise they'll kill the host, in which case the transposable element no longer can transpose itself, right? Um, um, but most of the time transposable elements go dead, right? If they don't copy themselves, eventually there's gonna be mutations in them and then they lose their ability to copy themselves. And so they go extinct. If you wanna think of the transposable element as a little, you know, is, as a, as a selfish unit or a, an organism itself living inside the genome. Um, they are behaving in a way such that it doesn't want to kill the host, but they also have to copy themselves in order to survive. All right, so they're doing an especially good job here in the lungfish. They're copying themselves very frequently. Uh, and they think that, and one of their explanations for that is, here we go, seems to be related to the reduction of P1W1 interacting RNAs and C2H2 zinc fingers and crupal associated box CRAB. All right, now I don't know the specifics of those particular genes, but I do understand, all right, uh, that these are various genes that an organism has that are trying to counteract transposable elements, right? I've just been explaining transposable elements are potentially disruptive to a genome if they end up copying themselves out and randomly inserting bits and pieces of DNA into the rest of the genome, they can disrupt the genome causing problems. So it's in, it behooves the organism to try to stop transposable elements, right? Transposable elements typically have, have typical sequences, you know, typical codes at each end of the sequence they're going to copy. And therefore, organisms have evolved the ability to recognize typical transposable elements and be able to suppress their action, right? Suppress their ability to copy themselves, right? So it's a defensive organ, a defensive system on the part of most animals. Uh, and you and I have these genes and all other animals, uh, especially all other vertebrates, have these particular genes and abilities to try to thwart the transposable elements that are in our genomes from disrupting us. So that's what these genes are. But you notice here what they're saying is there seems to be a reduction, right, in these with the ability to, tr to suppress transposable element expansion. So either they've there's mutations in those, 
or somehow the transposable element is actually suppressing the suppressor, okay? All right, allowing the transposable elements to remain active. Although transposable element abundance facilitates chromosomal rearrangements, lungfish chromosomes still conservatively reflect the, the uh, UR tetrapod uh, karyotype. They're just saying that despite all these transposable elements continually adding parts, the overall structure of the chromosomes is very similar among different uh, lungfish and even similar to other like amphibians and so forth. Uh, and so it doesn't disrupt the, uh, the structure other than adding more sequence all the time. The interesting thing here is that um, once your genome gets really, really big, right, and it's mostly transposable elements, so 90% of the genome being repetitive sequence, right, once it gets that large, actually having more activity from transposable elements in a way, you know, uh, may not be as damaging to an organism as it would be to a, to an organism with a smaller genome. Right. If, if you have a smaller genome and more of the genome is being used for uh, functions that are necessary for the survival of that organism, then having transposable elements move around and insert themselves can be very damaging. But if your genome grows to the point where the vast majority, all right, of the whole organism is repetitive sequence, and then you're making copies and randomly inserting it, well, since most of the space is not very useful to the organism, right? It's not necessary for their survival. Uh, inserting more transposable elements doesn't hurt the organism as much. In other words, you decrease the chance of hitting upon an active important region if most of the genome is a bunch of junk. Right? It's just a bunch of, it's a wasteland of repetitive sequences. Now, that's part of the lesson here. That's part of the um, the big picture here, because I'm what I'm thinking is that there are there are individuals who like to talk, especially um, intelligent designists and some young earth creationists who insist that you know the entire genome of an organism is designed right, and it's designed with functions, and we simply need to look and find those functions. But we're talking about organisms here that have genomes that are many, many, many times the size of a human genome. And yet the organisms most people would consider to be more simple than a human being, requiring less functional DNA probably to maintain the, the actions and abilities that they have. And yet they have these absolutely massive genomes. And here we see that these genomes might be adding many, many, many repetitive sequences. It's hard to imagine how all this repetitive sequence could have some func important function to the organism and be, in a way, designed for that organism for its life, uh, for for how it, well, like I just said, how it functions. That's the gist. I'm, I'm not going to spend as much time on these other papers because it's going to reiterate the same point. But I did want to show one other thing from here. Um, they assemble these genomes. Oh, yes. Uh, based on the transcriptome, transcriptome evidence, that is, all the sequences that are being transcribed and that they can use computers to suggest which ones are making proteins, right? How many different proteins, or, or what classically we think of how many genes, genes that make proteins, are found in these organisms? Homologous proteins of vertebrates, right? Those proteins that when they look at those sequences, they can identify as being uh, used also, being similar to some other vertebrate. Um, and ab initio gene prediction, right? There would be other genes that maybe they haven't, we haven't ever identified in any other, um, uh, I think that's what it means, the, any other vertebrate, uh, but they're pretty sure that it actually is a protein that's probably functional in this particular organism. We identified 19,770 protein coding genes in the South American lungfish. That was the one that had the largest genome. And then 19,181 in the African lungfish, which was a much smaller genome. And yet they have a very similar number of genes. Again, showing you that the excessive amount of additional total genomic space, all right, total uh, hereditary material uh, is mostly repetitive sequence that actually is encoding for, in this case, proteins. Um, they also looked at the Australian lungfish and the other two giant genomes and retrieved 21,552 coding genes. Um, so there was another lungfish that was that didn't have a record size genome, but actually has more genes, 
than this other one does. So we have a difference of, in this case, a couple thousand genes. That's quite a few different number of genes for another lungfish uh, type of organism. Now, let's let's relate that to human beings. I mean, well, there's different estimates for human beings. I don't know what the most up-to-date version is, but I usually tell my class somewhere like 23,000 to 25,000 genes in human beings. So lungfish, not that far off uh, you know, from a human being in terms of the number of protein-coding genes that are produced by its genome. But our 23,000 genes are found interspersed amongst 3.3 billion base pairs of sequence. And still, that's only 2% of the genome, right? 2% of our genome is protein-coding sequence at 25,000 genes. Here, they only have 19 or 20,000 genes, but that's scattered amongst 50 to 90 billion base pairs of sequence, right? So that's less than 1% of their genome, all right? A fraction of 1% of their genome is used for protein-coding sequence. All right, so that's that's lungfish. All right, this rest of the paper is all kinds of stuff about you know what's in the genome and how that relates to um, the different features of especially for the, the 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 limbs of these things. But let's go look at a larger genome. All right now, I said that was the largest known animal genome, but that isn't the largest genome known on Earth. Here's another recent paper. Uh, from Cell Press, and uh, this is the little figure they've got showing other genomes compared to this one. So, Mesipterus is a little fern, right? I've seen Mesipterus in Smoky Mountains. A uh, fairly nondescript small fern, right, is the current record holder for largest eukaryotic genome, Mesipterus oblanciata at 160 billion, 160 billion base pairs of DNA. I remember human beings, 3.3. So 50 times, 50 times the size of a human genome in this little tiny plant right here. Uh, there's another species, Mesipterus obliqua, that has 147 billion. And it's a very similar looking species. All right, so you, you, I, we could show both. The, well, here's here's the one and here's the other. Uh, they're both very small, tiny ferns. And yet they differ by, what, 23 billion base pairs. Right? Six times the size, eight times the size of a human genome difference between these two little ferns. Uh, and the previous record holder was Paris japonica. Uh, another plant, you have trilliums, um, common spring wildflower. And then they have, on this particular figure, they've got a couple lungfish. And these lungfish are a little larger than the one that I just showed you. Now, I, I need to tell you that in this paper, they didn't know about the sequences from those lungfish. And they were using estimates that are from measurements that not actual sequences in this case. These are like looking at uh, and estimating the total size or volume of nucleic acids inside the nucleus, and then using a calculation to figure out how many total base pairs there might be in that genome. Uh, and it's apparently an overestimate since they only found 90 uh, million in the one. Uh, another trillium and visium album, which is a, um, that is a uh, mistletoe. All right, so a bunch of plants with large genomes. There's many, 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 many plants that have far larger genomes than uh, human genomes. Fork firm genome shatters size record for eukaryotes. Vascular plants are exceptional among eukaryotes due to their outstanding genome size diversity in ranges at, with ranges of up to 2,400 fold. 2,400 fold difference between some plants including the largest genome so far recorded in the angiosperm, Paris japonica, at 148 billion base pairs. Despite available data showing the giant genomes are restricted across the tree of life, the biological limits to genome size expansion remain to be established. Here we report the discovery of an even larger eukaryotic gene, the Zipterus oblanciata, uh, the new Caledonian fork fern, at 160 billion base pairs. This record-breaking genome challenges current understanding and opens new avenues to explore evolutionary dynamics and genomic gigantism. Now, one question you might have is like, hmm, 
how do they do it? Like, how, how do they have 160 billion base pair? Doesn't that require all, like a whole lot of energy? I mean, we talk about like 3 billion base pairs and you have trillions of cells. You'd have to copy all that DNA. Copying takes energy, right? You have to, you have to, you also have to um, synthesize the components of the DNA. And then the act of copying them as well, putting them all together requires energy. So if you're a cell of one of these little plants, um, it's going to take actual physical space to put something that's 50 times the size of a human genome. And you got to copy all that material, right? Every time you copy a cell, you got to copy every single one of those base pairs and make a duplicate of it. The ever expanding exploration of 20,000 eukaryotic genomes has revealed an astounding array of genome sizes distributed across the eukaryotic tree of life. Right. And what does it do? It influences cell sizes. Well, yeah, if you have a massive genome, you're probably going to have a little bit larger cell because you literally need the physical space to store that large genome. Life cycles, the physiology, the morphology, and ultimately impacting the ecology and evolution of species. Yeah, it's going to require more energy to copy them. There's more chances of making mistakes when you copy it, when you have that large of a genome, right? You get, you got to separate, you have a lot of chromosomes. You got to separate all those chromosomes. You can make a lot more mistakes. You have, and then during meiosis, you're doing all this crossing over. You're going to have a tremendous amount of diversity. So you can see there might be different forces at, at play here. Hey, a larger genome means you have a lot more space to play with in terms of potentially creating new genes. Um, and having reorganization and trying out new combinations of, of, of how you're going to use those genes, right? So you, you can have advantages, but there's also disadvantages tangling up the chromosomes during replication, the amount of energy used, as I mentioned before. Um, so there are pressures to reduce your overall size of the genome. And, and again, the theme here and all, all I'm talking about is that we have these organisms that we're talking about have many times in excess of the amount of actual sequence they need in order to encode the things they need to be the species that they are. Right? They only need a hundredth, a thousandth, or ten thousandth of the amount of sequence in order to code for the things that they need to be exactly the thing that you see there as an organism. And that's true for human beings as well. We don't need a lot of our sequence, but we have it. And so the interesting question is, why do we have it? Well, I've already seen, you've already seen one of the answers to that. Like in the lungfish, they have lots of transposable elements, repetitive sequences. They have elements inside the genome that are selfishly copying themselves and amplifying the genome. And the organism, in many organisms, are trying to suppress that. And then they also have... Um, when they're having mutations such that, I mean, many mutations eliminate sequence, right? Through crossing over, through mistakes in replication, you lose pieces of DNA. And so you can be losing DNA. And if you're not copying other portions of DNA, your genome can shrink. And for some organisms, there is a pressure to shrink because shrinkage of genome becomes more efficient, right? More, ener especially energetically efficient. So if you're a little tiny organism with limited resources, you don't want to be spending all your time you, and all your energy copying your DNA. And so any mutations that reduce the size of the genome will be favored under some environments. So the, the idea here is that all these larger, immense sized genomes probably are in organisms that don't have, um, that uh, probably don't have a selective pressure to reduce the genome. And they might be infected by these elements that are copying themselves and therefore pushing their genomes to larger and larger size. And the organism, it might not be good for the organism, but they can still survive. And so you can think of it as like a parasite, right? The organism has a parasite, it's growing larger, the genome's growing larger, but it still has enough energy. It still is faithful enough in its replication that it can still continue to survive over long periods of time. Um, it's doubtful that there's like a significant function to having a larger size. Like, oh, this is an advantage. So therefore, selection is selecting for my for me to increase the size of my genome. Um, again, if you look across all the different types of eukaryotes, you only see these larger, massive genomes pop up in a few places, and there's usually some explanation for their increase in size. Um, the 
um, a lot of parasitic organisms have either extra small genomes because they don't need a lot of their genes and so they've gotten rid of some of their genes. Um, but some of them also have much larger genomes because parasites don't care about their energy. They don't need to conserve energy because they're living in a host and they're just taking stuff from the host. And so there isn't any selective pressure to reduce the size of the genome. And also the host can provide some uh, protection to the organism. So they tend to not be as selective about their own genes being preserved exactly right. So they make a lot of mistakes, right? And so their genomes tend to proliferate errors and a lot of errors of replication, increasing the genome size. But I got myself distracted here. Uh, miniature sized fungal genomes, including the smallest eukaryotic genome found in the microsporidium uh, intestinalis, all right, so that's a, a, an organism that's living inside intestines. Uh, so it's basically a parasitic DNA, only has 2.6 million base pairs. That's a, a million base pair, not billion base pairs. 2.6 million base pairs for eukaryote. Remember, eukaryote, an organism has a nucleus. Right, so it's relatively complicated, but it still it can survive with only 2.6 million base pairs of sequence, as opposed to this fern that has 160 billion base pairs. Um, contrast with the, those that are found in groups where genomes have expanded up to five orders of magnitude, yet it's only within a few animal and plant lineages that truly extreme Genomic expansions beyond 100 billion base pairs are known. Among animals, obese genomes, obese genomes, I like that, exist in just two chordate lineages. The lungfishes, where they reach up to 129, uh, that was, again, that's an estimate, not based on actual sequence. Um, and then the some salamanders that have genomes up to 117 billion base pairs. In contrast, several vascular plant groups have successfully expanded into the upper end of the genome size spectrum and comprise six of the top 10 largest eukaryotic genomes known, uh, including Paris japonica. Extreme genomes have also been reported in the parasitic viscum album. All right, so that's, I said that's the, uh, that's um, uh, mistletoe, all right? That's a type of mistletoe. And in the ferns, in the Silotaceae family, uh, in particular, in Mesipterus. All right, Silotasis by the way, Silotum, uh, which is one of the genuses, genera, from which the family is named, is a fern that doesn't really have leaves. It's just like these little, it's just stems, basically. Uh, so it's actually an extremely simple fern, and yet it has this incredibly large uh, genome size. All right, so again, there's the figure. That's what uh, Mesipterus looks like. And that's all I want to do there. Now let's look at diatoms really quick. Since we've been going on for a while here. Diatom abundance in polar oceans is predicted by genome size. I want to talk about, this is an example of, of um, a selective pressure on an organism that then results in uh, allowing for either large genomes or for or selecting for small genomes. A principal goal in ecology is to identify the determinants of species abundance in nature. Yeah, I mean, why, why are certain species found in extreme numbers in one place and low numbers in another place? Why are there hundreds of species in one area and very limited numbers of species maybe in another area? Those are fundamental questions in ecology. Body size has emerged as a fundamental repeatable predictor of abundance with smaller organisms occurring in greater numbers than larger ones. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of intuitive, right? Uh, a, there's a lot more insects, right? Different kinds of species of insects uh, on a particular tree in, a, in the tropics than there would be larger uh, mammals, right? There might be one or two mammals at most uh, in a tree. A biogeographic component known as Berg Bergman's rule describes the preponderance across taxonomic groups of larger bodied organisms in colder areas. Now, the question is, what about cold versus warm locations? Although undeniably important, the extent to which body size is a key trait underlying these patterns is unclear. We explored the questions in diatoms, unicellular algae of global importance for the role in carbon fixation 
an energy flow through marine food webs. I think of diatoms as those the little unicellular organisms. They do photosynthesis and they have a unique property of making uh, silicon, silicon um, uh, cell walls. So basically they live in glass houses, right? They make these ornate structured glass houses and they live inside of those. And since they're unicellular, they're just one cell, um, but there's a hundred thousand different species of them and they grow like everywhere on earth, right? From the Arctic all the way down to the tropics, uh, to ocean, freshwater, and on land in any place that's wet, uh, you'll be able to find diatoms. And so they come in many different shapes and sizes. So you can kind of, let's say interesting, so you can do some interesting comparisons of why are diatoms more prevalent in one area than another. Using a phylogenomic data set from a single lineage of worldwide distribution, we found that body size cell volume was strongly correlated with genome size. Okay, so now here's where the genome size comes in, which varied by 50 fold across species. So between two different species of a diatom, you could have a 50 fold difference in the size of their genomes, even though they're making little tiny single celled organisms that essentially look almost the same. And we could just identify them as being different species because they have a different shape glass house. Right? but they have a massive difference in their genome size. Um, and what caused these differences in genome size? Driven by differences in the amount of repetitive DNA. It's not that they have a different number of genes. They essentially have the same genes. They just have a very different amount of repetitive sequence, transposable elements, and all the other types of repeat units that they have, microsatellites and so forth. Um, However, directional models identify temperature and genome size, not cell size, as having the greatest influence on maximum population growth rate. So they went ahead and they looked at um, how genome size is a strong predictor of species abundance in the ocean, but only in colder regions at higher and lower altitudes where diatoms and large genomes dominated. Um, Oh, yeah. I don't want to get, I um, just realized, I don't want to get down into the weeds of this. I just want to show you one thing from this. Uh, and that's basically this right here. This figure shows minimum cell volume. Um, and so the color coding is the cell volume, the size of the cell. Uh, and so this light color would be a very small cell. And these darker, the darker the color, the larger the cell. And this is a log 10, all right? So these are big differences uh, in cell size. And here, here's some pictures of these diatoms, right? So here's number three right here is a single, that's one single cell right there, right? And that's the species. And what they're saying is that this isn't like, okay, it's gonna grow larger. No, they make this glass house and it's the size it is, right? Because it's made of glass, right? It doesn't expand, all right? So you know, here's the cell, they make the glass house. Um, the whole replication process is interesting, but uh, don't have time for that. Um, the point is, is that uh, if you say, well, that's a particular species and you see thousands of individuals of this, that's the size that they are, right? There's going to be some variance, but it's not like, oh, I got a really big version of me, a little tiny version of me. No, the species is characterized by these little tiny, tiny cells, right? And you have to take a much closer look on their microscope to see the, the ultra structure of them. And then you have these other cells that are far larger. All right, so this, these are very big differences in cell size, but these are each individual single cells. Uh, and then so you see the, this is a, a phylogeny showing the relationships of all these different uh, diatoms. And a bunch of these are in the same, you know, same genus. And there's a bunch of different genera and they're showing a bunch of different individual different species. Uh, and so here's an example where here's a couple that have small cell sizes in the Thalassoria, Syrah, and there's other species, right? Actually, they did two different species and they did two other species, two other, uh, another species, two individuals of that, uh, which are much larger. And then they're correlating that with the genome size. How big are the genomes of these things? And you'll see that these really long bars here are genome size of up to 1.5, you know, 1500 million base pairs is, or 1.5 billion base pairs. Um, megabyte, which is 
And then other ones down here are in the, you know, 200, uh, 100 million, maybe at most million base pairs, right? So we have huge differences in genome size. And then they correlate that with um, other factors. So here's the estimated genome size. This is log 10 here now. Um, and minimum cell volume. So it does relate. That kind of makes sense. I mean, if you got a huge genome, you might need a larger cell in order to be efficient um, with copying it and manipulating that particular genome. It's going to take a lot more space. Smaller genome, you can have a smaller cell. It's not necessarily that having a smaller genome means you can do less and somehow that makes you smaller because these actually these diatoms probably have a very similar number of genes in all of them. It's all this extra repetitive DNA stuff uh, that makes them different. And then over here you see doubling time. All right, doubling time. How long does it take to copy the cells? Right, and so you see that uh, the smaller the genome, the faster you can double the cell. Again, that's fairly intuitive. It's, so it's almost like this would probably be predictable. You could, you probably would have drawn up that hypothesis that the smaller the cell, the smaller the genome, the more quickly you can copy that cell. All right, because you're going to copy the DNA. It's not going to take that long to copy a small genome. But if you have a billion base pairs. It just takes longer to copy the DNA itself, and you have to do that every time you're going to copy a cell. Um, so longer doubling times. So how does that fit in with, I can't remember if there's a, yeah, there's a figure here, but it, 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 the most important relationship they found was is that if you live in colder waters, right, cold water also slows down the doubling time. Right. And so organisms just naturally aren't going to be copying themselves as much in colder water. And so they could afford to have larger genomes. In other words, there's no selective pressure to smaller genomes. If you live in uh, the tropics and you're a diatom, then replication is really important because you're constantly being eaten. Right. There's a bunch of organisms that specialize on filtering uh, diatoms. And so copying yourself is really important. And the faster you can copy yourself, it's like bacteria, right? They're copying themselves as fast as they can under good conditions. So if you're copying yourself quickly, but you have a massive genome that's slowing you down, that's going to be a disadvantage, right? That's a selected disadvantage. So you're going to be selected, for, you're selecting for a smaller and smaller and smaller genome. You may also be selecting for smaller cells as well at the same time. Uh, and those that are in the uh, cold region, right, where it's much, much colder, uh, finds that their copying time is slower and they also have potentially larger genomes. So interesting relationship there, but the big point here is that, hey, you got diatoms, which are all kind of similar to one another, different comes, comes in different shapes and sizes and they live in different environments. And here you have some that have these massive genomes, but they're not, those cells aren't any more special in terms of their capacities and abilities to do things than other diatoms that have small genomes. So what is the rest of the genome doing? Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious that the rest of the genome isn't really, isn't really necessary for their survival, right? It isn't doing anything to, any, it doesn't have any functional reason for being there. It's simply a product of the fact that the organism can afford to have a larger genome. And so repetitive elements copy and increase the size of the genome and the organism doesn't try to stop it, right? It doesn't expend a lot of energy to say, no, 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 we can't get, we can't get this genome get larger or it's going to cause us to suffer. If they're not suffering, then the genome just gets larger, right? It's not all design space for something that they need to do. Um, you know what? I was going to cover uh, one other thing, but I think I'm going to not. The challenge to intelligent designists and young earth creationists would be to explain why, when you look at two species of what they think are the same kind of organism, God created lungfish as a kind of organism. And then one lungfish has, you know, the equivalent of 25 human genomes more DNA than another lungfish. 
And even that lungfish is has 10 times the amount of a human genome itself. Right? Is all that sequence really necessary for that organism? Is it all there and it all has some purpose and function? Because what I'm hearing from certain uh, folks like Casey Luskin and others at uh, the Discovery Institute is that, you know, that all the genome is somehow useful to the organism, right? It all has function. We just need to find it, right? That, 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 that all these different repetitive elements actually are functional if we just learned how to, if we just were to study it and figure that out. No, I think it really is junk, all right? Junk in the sense that it's not necessary for their survival. They could, if they, if you cast it out, if you cut it out of the organism, they would go on their merry way and they'd be just fine. And we see these really disparate genomes between very closely species, very closely related species, where one of them has twice the amount of DNA as another one, and yet they morphologically look almost identical to one another. They behave the same as each other. They have the same capacities, the same abilities. One doesn't have twice as many things that it can do as the other organism because it has twice as much DNA. All right? That's useless, functionless DNA that's there as a byproduct of how the organisms change over time and the competitive nature of the sequences themselves, either contracting or expanding within genomes. All right, so that's just a, a quick survey of some really, you know, some papers that have come out recently that um, uncover some of the larger genomes that we know of in the world. Yeah, I'm sure we'll probably find another one that'll beat this. There's always somebody who will, who's looking for the next largest genome. Of course, there at some point there's a limit, right? Some organism here on Earth alive today has the largest genome. Um, but we'll probably never know that we found it unless we sequence the genome of every single organism on Earth. By the way, it's just a really amazing thing to be able to sequence 160 billion base pairs. Or in the case of the, the lobe fish, right? 91 billion base pairs. When you think about the difficulty it was to sequence the first human genome that was 3 billion base pairs. And to de novo sequence, like from scratch, just sequence 91 billion base pairs. Um, the way you do that, by the way, is you have to sequence it over and over and over again with lots of overlapping parts in order to figure out the chromosomes. And so in order to, I didn't look it up in the paper, I'm sure it says how much total sequence they did. But to sequence one of those um, lungfish genomes, I'm sure they had to collect on the order of a trillion base pairs or more uh, in order to sort that out into the 91 billion base pair genome that they have. So trillions, trillions of base pairs sequenced for that particular project, just to look at several um, lungfish genomes. All right, that's it. That's just my uh, my thoughts on uh, extra large genomes. I, you know, I'm just fascinated with this stuff. You know, the smallest genome, the largest genome in my class, my genomics class, uh, we do actually spend a lot of time looking at tiny genomes. Uh, and what they mean and what they tell us about what the minimum requirements are for life. Because that's that's the one that's, there are many, many more scientists that are trying to understand the smallest genome or find the smallest genomes and then characterize those genomes than there would be those looking for the largest genome. Because at this point, it's obvious what the largest genome is. The largest genome is just full of extra stuff. And you could always like, you know what? toss on another, you know, 10 billion base pairs of repetitive sequence and you got a larger genome, but uh, that doesn't really give us that much new information about organisms functions. But if you're looking at the smallest genome and you find one that's like, well, this is the minimal number of genes that seems to be necessary for you to make a viable cell that can copy itself. And then you find another one that's missing 10 of those genes. You're like, well, I guess those 10 genes weren't absolutely essential for life, right? And so you can actually do it with even fewer genes. And so there's like, there's, there's this constant, you know, there's this constant race to look at more and more organisms and try to find members that are closely related to those that might have lost even more genes or have even fewer genes.
uh, right from the beginning and to identify like what is that minimal set and once you know what that minimal set is then that allowed well you know one of the things folks want to do and, and is being done is basically creating synthetic organisms where you say like here's the minimum set of genes that you would need as sort of your operating system you know so you have this and that's your basic cell and then you say, okay, now I can add these other properties, right? I want to, I wanted to have these other characteristics. Those are going to be added genes, right? Added information to that original genome. But alas, I'm not here to talk about tiny genomes. We were just talking about large genomes. The tiny genomes is a story for another day. So until then, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.